Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the General Eclectic Podcast with Rod Dreer. I'm your host, Kale Zeldin, and we are here for episode number 30. Uh, Rod, hello to you, sir. How are things down in the great state of Louisiana? It's hot, man. It is so hot here. I I spent last week with the guy, uh, Ben Wallace Wells, a reporter for the New Yorker magazine. He came down late Luck, last week just lucky for the day him. lucky him wow Ooh. yeah he came out just for the day to interview me about hungary and why conser- certain conservatives like hungary but the guy walked out of the airport and i thought he was gonna die i mean he was <laughs> like welcome to louisiana in late yeah, august yeah. but um but i went and got a nice haircut i think you can see and it looks good sir it looks good thank you thank you thank you i'm proud of it um and i'm good. also been been getting close oh. to my friend dante oh, oh, oh. here because oh. i'm Going back to Italy uh, this week, um, I'll probably mm-hmm. by the time this comes out, I'll probably be there. Yeah. I've got the Italian book tour for Live Not By Lies. Great, great. Uh, what, what, what do they have planned for you there, Rod? I'm going to Rome. It's a public event in Rome, one in Milan, one in Ferrara, and one in Verona. Nice. And uh, when it's over, I'm going to go for the day to visit the ruined abbey of San Galgano in Tuscany, oh, which and- features in my one of my favorite movies, Andrei Tarkovsky's Nostalgia, and uh, and also go to the church of San Galgano and, um, and pray now, there. Now, so, now, are you are you going to see the, the, the sword? I am. Oh. For our listeners who don't know, um, the, the whole sword in the stone thing, Excalibur and all that, that actually came from a real life story. In uh, uh, 12th century Tuscany, there was this knight uh, named uh, Galgano Guidotti, and he was kind of a, a roustabout, and he had a vision in which St. Michael the Archangel said, God wants you to leave the world and dedicate yourself to him, and he didn't want to do it. So not long after that, Galgano was on his horse riding past this uh, tall hill in Tuscany, and the horse starts taking him up to the top of the mountain, even though he didn't want to go. Yeah. When he gets up there, Galgano sees Jesus Christ and the 12 apostles. And Jesus says, dude, I, I really, really want you to do this. But Galgano was so strong-willed, he said, it would be easier for me, Lord, to put this sword into a stone than to leave the world uh, for you. He brought the sword down on a stone, and it goes in almost up to the hilt. Well, he left the world lived as a hermit there and they eventually you know when he died he became a saint Mm -hmm. and they built a church around the where the sword is in the stone here's the thing you can still go see it the sword in the stone and most people thought it it has to be a fake sure even though this has been documented since the day of his death in the 12th century because the church sent a cardinal up there to investigate and they, Mm -hmm. they they documented it well in 2001 some italian scientists went and examined it, took x-rays, tested the metal. They concluded that the metal is in fact 12th century metal. And they saw that the sword really did go down into the stone. They can't explain any of it. Sure. So um, anyway, I uh, the reason this means a lot to me, Kale, right, is right. Uh, three years ago, I was in uh, Genoa on the last uh, stop of my Benedict Option book tour in Italy. Mm-hmm. And on that night, a man came up to me, uh, an older man, and his English was very bad, but he said he's an artist, and he was praying earlier in the day, and the Holy Spirit told him to come there that night and give me this thing. And he hands me a, um, a, a, a big manila folder. I opened it up, and there was a drawing in there that he had made himself mm-hmm. of a saint kneeling on a, a rock looking up at a cross. And he said, this... I've, the name of this is The Temptation of San Galgano. I'm like, oh, great. Thank you. I didn't sure, know who this yeah. was, but thanks very much. Mm-hmm. Well, I looked it up, and um, and I've come to believe, um, because of things that have happened since then, especially the way this Tarkovsky movie fell into my life yeah, at exactly yeah. the right point, that God somehow has, has brought San Galgano into my life for a reason. And uh, I'm getting to kind of a crossroads. I mean, as you and I have talked offline, and I've said a bit on my on my blog that there's a, a possibility of doing more work in Europe to help build networks for the you know for the coming resistance. I, I believe that we're all going to have to be living. So uh, I'm just going to go pray to see if this is maybe what God wants me to do, or whatever God has for me to sure. do. But I, I yeah. think that there's a reason San Galgano came into my life, and you know me, I'm always uh, on the search of. Uh, of mystical woo-woo things. So well, well no, I mean, you know, it's funny. I mean, it's an incredible story. I mean, in, in you know, knowing you as I have for the last 
um, several years here, like these sort of things have a strange way of happening to you, you know. Um, uh, they do. It, they really it, do. It really, it, it's really kind of incredible. You know, I, I, this kind of stuff doesn't happen to me. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm very comfortable with the woo. Uh, that doesn't that doesn't at all um, uh, weird me out or anything. But uh, they this this phenomenon really does seem to sort of circle and surround you quite 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 frequently. So I'm really excited that you get this opportunity uh, to go uh, to this place because I remember when you told me the story. I guess it was about three years ago. Dad. Yeah, um, I, I just couldn't believe it. I was like, you know, this is a, such an incredible story, and and it seems so incredibly um, uh, uh, crafted uh, or, or 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 intended like for you. It's uh, really it's really pretty incredible. So that's that's great, man. That's that's exciting. So I'll, I'll um, have a good story for our listeners when I come back, one way or the other. Yeah, no, that that that's great. That's great. All right. Well, um, look, you've been home for about what twelve days. It seems like it's been, <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know if it seems like it's been longer than that for you, but lots and lots of stuff, of course, has been uh, afoot. We recorded last week. We did have some recording issues. So most of you have probably only heard our last podcast because we had issues with the video. Um, but uh, we recorded on the, I think it was the morning uh, of or the morning after the Afghanistan debacle uh, became manifest. Um, and I believe uh, those uh, very... Um, uh, uh, significant and impactful images of the of the the, the plane leaving um, uh, Bagram Airport Air Air, Air Base um, were were so telling with the people falling from and that was Scott, Kabul Airport because Kabul, guess what sorry. the other guys the Taliban now owns Bagram right right so you know uh, and in that if if our listeners and viewers remember in that in our last episode we were really kind of just caught a little bit flat-footed in one sense, just because of how um, uh, awful and pathetic really um, uh, this, this, this whole um, this thing has been, this whole scene has been and how revealing uh, it has been. Um, and, you know, we, we talk a lot on this podcast about um, culture and the significance of culture. And it really seems to be pretty clear uh, that the, um, uh, our elites, those people who are in charge of, of the sort of the meta levels uh, of our world, especially here in the United States and therefore all around the globe, um, uh, either have been caught asleep at the wheel uh, or, or something else. I mean, where, where are you now a week out from all this stuff, Rod? Look, I think it's going to get a lot worse because I, I think once the August 31st deadline passes, if Biden can't convince the Taliban to extend it, and really they have no reason to extend it, they yeah. hold all the cards. There's no here, leverage, right? There's no leverage. Then every single American left in Afghanistan becomes a potential hostage. I have a. a How many? Really, what are we talking numbers wise? Do you have any idea about that? I think we're talking between 40 and 50,000. Thousand. Yeah. Yeah, forty and, and fifty thousand uh, U.S. citizens. Yeah, yeah, oh. uh, and um, you know we could be looking at a replay of the nineteen seventy nine Iranian hostage crisis um, uh, on a massive scale. I hope it doesn't come to that, but I think we need to prepare ourselves for the possibility that this could happen, because the uh, Taliban knows perfectly well that every one of those Western hostages is potential money in the bank. That's right, and. Um, uh, you know, I, I think you're a little bit younger than me, yeah. so you probably wouldn't remember the Iran hostage crisis. Well, I, I, was, I was just going to ask you, I do remember it. I remember all the, you know, the, the you know, those are real. That's right. As I'm kind of coming into consciousness of th consciousness of things. But mm -hmm. why don't you reset that for us? I mean, 79. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, this is something that that didn't just last a week or two. Right. I and mean, this is right. all, more than a year. Right. More than a year. Yeah. It. um I was 12 years old when it started, and what mm -hmm. happened was the, there had been a revolution in Iran, uh, anti-American revolution, and uh, some quote-unquote students, Iranian uh, radical students, took over the American embassy and took like a, um, a, a number of our diplomats as hostages, and they kept them from over a year. This uh, the drama of all this uh, completely captivated the whole nation for the entire period. I think it was like 444 days, all things wow. uh, all told. There was uh, Jimmy Carter was the president at the time, and he was mm -hmm. seeming very overmatched anyway by the bad economy, by the fact mm -hmm. that the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. It looked like we were being thrown back during the Cold War. And yeah. then this happens when right. the superpower is totally humiliated by these Muslim extremists. Um, 
Ronald Reagan ran for president against Carter with all this going on. And uh, that's one of the main reasons we got Reagan, because uh, Carter, just whatever strength and legitimacy his administration had, was drained away day by day by this ongoing humiliation. Right. And uh, it was a horrible time for the country. I can remember well, Kale, one morning I got up to get ready for school and I crossed the hallway from out of my bedroom and I heard the TV on in my parents' room. They had the, mm -hmm. the, the door open and I could see through their door President Carter addressing the nation live. This is like before daylight. Yeah, wow. Telling us about the the failed hostage rescue mission oh, in the yeah, desert. Of course, of course. And I can remember feeling, I mean, I'm I'm a kid then, right? Yeah, but I remember yeah. feeling this sense of of total humiliation yeah. and a sense of out just unshirted spite at Jimmy Carter for being so weak and having led our country to this. Wow. Now, you wow. know, fair, and I don't know how fair that was, but that I'm just saying this had that yeah. kind of political effect. Yeah. So uh, I'm thinking that if um, if Joe Biden, if it gets to that, if we, if God forbid, we have a repeat of that in in Afghanistan and, mm -hmm. and certainly on a much bigger scale, it's going to destroy the Biden administration. But here's the thing: we as a country were much uh, in a much stronger place back then. We were much more uh, held together, and you know, we had. You're talking been, about internally in terms internally, of culture, yeah, and internally, community. we were. Yeah. yeah, and we could uh, we could absorb that. I don't know how that plays out now, especially given that we have seen so many failures of our elites in just the past 20 years. I mean, the failure of uh, the Iraq war to begin with, going right. in there to begin with, right. uh, the attempt to nation build in Afghanistan, a failure, the failure to deal with New Orleans and Katrina, right. the failure to hold anybody accountable after the 2008 crash and on and on and on. And now, mm -hmm. You know, a co the whole COVID debacle, which has caused a lot of people, for better or for worse, I mean, it's so confusing, I don't know what to believe anymore, but uh, it has certainly caused a lot of people not to trust our institutions. And now on top of all that, Kale, we have um, the, the American mm -hmm. State Department, the military with generals who've been lying for 20 years about the state of things there. State Department wasn't ready for this. Right. Um, the, uh, you know, we didn't even know where all our people were we, we thought that, you know, we spent uh, all this money uh, training and equipping the Afghans. You would not believe, Kale, the number of weapons, uh, very sophisticated weapons that now are in the Taliban's hands, American weapons manufactured in America, paid for by the American taxpayer. They now belong to the Taliban because of the incompetence of the American elites. So if this all goes down in Afghanistan like it just might, I don't know where we're going to be there in terms of domestic uh, unrest and domestic anger. It's it's going to be very very dark. Yeah, I don't know how I don't know how this gets spun uh, in 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 such a way that the you know the, the current administration can just sort of hope that this goes away in the news cycle. Like I I know that there's a sort of a general level of cynicism about such things that you know whatever bad news, it comes, it goes, but certain things have a way of sort of acting as a kind of albatross uh, around um, an administration's neck. And this certainly strikes me as one that 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 could have real staying power, um, not least of which for the reasons that you've laid out. I mean, we uh, uh, heavily armed the Afghan uh, army with the sophisticated weaponry um, that has now just been simply um, Given up, taken over by by the Taliban, and you know the 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 Taliban, um, despite what what some of our military elites have said on television programs uh, and and whatnot, you know these are bad dudes. They are not good people. Um, certainly, in any kind of um, Western or watered down Western morality, they just don't care, man. Oh, it's yeah. it's it's ugly. Yeah, no, and they don't have to care anymore. They hold all the cards here. And um, it, it's just striking how fast this came down. And, and while I absolutely believe that we should heap contempt on the Biden administration, it would be unfair to say it's all on them. This is on the last four administrations we've had. I mean, Obama could have gotten out of there. He didn't. Trump could have gotten out at the very end. He made those moves to we're getting out now because of Trump, mm -hmm. um, but because Trump started it, but he could have started that much earlier. Well, uh, I, I want to push back a little bit on this because this is sort of where I've been thinking lately. You know, I, you know, I, I, 
leave Trump out of it for a second here, but you know, you look at somebody like like Obama. I mean, like, why do you think he, um, you know, look, every president since Bush has has run on this idea of getting out of of nation building and and foreign wars, right? Yeah. Um, you know, it has not been a you know a a, a, a popular thing to run on. Why do you think he pulled off, or do you think that that he was powerless to do anything about it? That's just not my understanding of no. what the what the executive of the United States um, has with him, and why didn't they pull yeah. out? Well, I think because Obama believed the generals. I mean, I one of the things I'll say to Joe Biden's credit is um, it's in, I believe it's in the notes of when the generals came to Obama when Ob- when Obiden when Biden was vice president, you know, and tried to convince him to keep staying in Afghanistan. I, I seem to recall reading that Biden was like, no, no, I, I'm I'm not buying it, but Obama did buy it. And so I think a lot of this goes on to the generals. You'll remember a couple of years ago, the Washington Post published what they call the Afghanistan Papers, a collection of classified documents, uh, a history of the Afghan war, talking to uh, military commanders and others who had had a lot to do with it, all of them saying that we never knew what the hell we were doing. Uh, Well, so the other night, um, I guess it was, was it Saturday night when Donald Trump had this rally in, in Alabama In Alabama, you know, he was uh, cracking on Biden and you know that a certain amount of that is understandable, but then sure. he got to gloating about it. And I don't, I don't know, it struck me as really unpatriotic because what's happening here is terrible for our whole country, not just for Joe Biden, but for our whole country and for the people of Afghanistan. But then Trump started doing that thing Trump always does, which is just riffing. He's like, generals, we've got great generals, most of them. The bad generals, according to Trump, are those who don't support him. And I'm thinking, you know, this is this is why if we reelect Trump as a, a Trump restoration as a way to repudiate what happened to Biden, it's going to be a disaster because Trump has no freaking idea why things are the way they are. And he'll believe whatever this military tells him. Well, so, uh, maybe, but I mean, you're you're also putting an awful lot of um, cognitive capability upon Biden right now that I'm just not convinced we can safely assume. Right. To be right. fair, honestly, I just, I mean, I don't know what, I don't know if you've seen any of these uh, television interviews or his performances. I mean, it yeah. it looks kind of scary, dude. I mean, He's what is your there. take on He's that? He's not there. No. He's not. I mean, right. And this is why I called. I had a blog post this week saying America, the Chernyenko years, because uh, which is something that you have to be a certain age to understand. Uh, okay, so, so tell Chernyenko, us, tell us about the uh, Chernyenko uh, years. Yeah, and this is a reference to Biden's senility and just the gerontocracy that runs this country now. Um, uh, what what is a gerontocracy? What's that? What is a gerontocracy? Uh, a rule by the elderly. Thank you. Thank um, you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so Leonid Brezhnev was one of the longtime rulers of the Soviet Union. When he died in 8081, the Soviets got Yuri Andropov, who was the head of the KGB. He took over and he dies like after a year and a half. Yeah. Then they put this old guy, Konstantin Chernyenko from the Politburo in. He wasn't even in there that long. You know, he it was. And so he became it before he died. And then they got Gorbachev and the whole thing fell apart. Uh, the point is the Chernyenko years is Chernyenko was... Um, a symbol at the time of the feebleness of this elderly, corrupt uh, Soviet teetering, system. teetering Soviet system. Yeah. yeah, the gerontocracy, because he was an old, sick old man when he was when he was put in there. But the system itself had lost the ability to to govern itself. It was losing its legitimacy. They mm-hmm. finally wised up and got a younger guy, Mikhail Gorbachev, who thought he was going to save the system, but in fact, he opened the, as soon as you let a little daylight into it, it was over for the Soviets. But so I, I think that you know, we're not the late Soviet Union, but I think that there is a, a comparison to be made there between uh, what was happening then with this totally insular, superannuated uh, leadership class in, uh, in the late Soviet Union and where we are today. Um, Biden is, what, 80 years old. Nancy Pelosi is in her 80s. Um, Schumer. Donald, Schumer. Donald Trump is 75. I mean, it's it's really, really something at a time when we need to have a more uh, aggressive, lively leadership to get us out of this this hole. It's just like we seem to be stuck. 
Well, why why have we been unable to sort of normally, you know, process, you know, people make their way through their their prime years and then they, you know, go off and take on maybe some consulting roles, but you know, you make room for the next generation and the next generation. Why have we been so unable or unwilling to move uh, the gerontocracy on? I mean, I, what is that about? Boy, that's a, that, you know, that's a great question. One that I'm not prepared to answer, but I think it's beyond just our politics. You know? Oh yeah. No, I agree. It's just, this is cross institutionally. That's sort of why I bring it up and yeah, I'm not trying to put you just on the don't spot, go away. of course. They just don't go away. The yeah. Boomers. And yeah. Um, I think that uh, we have something has changed in our culture. You know, Americans have always been like, we're going to live forever. We're going to deny death. I think it's taken on this perverse, uh, a perverse manifestation in our culture where these people who hold high offices, they just don't want to give it up because I can't imagine life without work, the work they do and the, the privilege they have. That's all I can figure. But um, I, I mean, don't think that we should go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, I mean, haven't they made enough money? Haven't they made enough, you know, tours around the world and flex their power? And I, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm just made of different stuff, but I can tell you right now, you know, at, at 80 years old, I do not want to be fighting young punks in the Senate or, or you know, fighting with a pride. I'd like to, you know, be out back, you know, sipping a, an afternoon iced tea and reading a book you know, under the yeah. tree when I'm 80 years old, God willing. I mean, I just, I don't understand the, the strange, I, I find I, it very strange. I, no, I, think, strange. I think you're right. And I think that we have developed in this culture, uh, it, we've been a youth culture for a while. We've sort of hero worshiped youth, at least since yeah. the 50s and 60s. Yeah. And the flip side of that is we do not respect old age as a period of life that in itself. So you have Pelosi and Biden getting their faces pulled so tight yeah, you bounce a quarter off of it, yeah, you know, and continuing to work as if they were young people yeah. and to deny the fact that, you know what, they're old and it's okay to be old. Yeah. But in our culture, it's not okay to be old. And uh, it's, well, what's, what, what's interesting to me about that phenomena, besides the plastic surgery part of, of the phenomena, is that, you know, they're making consequential decisions right now that they simply are not going to be around uh, to live with. Yeah. You know, it's like, right, you know, right now, if I make a decision, I'm 40 years old, if I make a decision, you know, I, I'm going to be with this decision for the next 35 years. Um, you know, but if you're 80, in your 80s, and you're making consequential decisions, you know, you're gonna be gone soon. And and yeah. I wonder how what the how that plays a, a, a part in your incentive structure, you know, your, your, I wonder your, your if decision they even, making. I wonder if they even think about it. Yeah, Honestly, yeah. I mean, it. But it's a strange thing because when this plays out in other in other areas, that means people like you and me, younger people, and people below us, the millennials and Gen Z, every the yeah. pipeline gets jammed up. Yeah. And uh, you know, I read some statistic the other day showing that um, that when when the boomers were the age as Gen Z is now, they may, they own something like twenty percent of the economy. Gen Z has two percent. Yeah. Yeah. Some some figure like that. Don't hold me to that specifically, but, and I'm thinking that has got to affect people. I think Megan McArdle uh, was the one who said on Twitter once that, mm -hmm. you know, when when your capitalist system doesn't allow young people to accumulate capital, why exactly should they support it? Right. You know, and I think that that could right. be the mm -hmm. the a knock on effect of of what you've been talking about the the gerontocracy. These old people just. These boomers just holding on, holding on, can't give it up. Uh, that it it causes a lot of resentment among the young. Well, for sure. I mean, and you're sort of wondering, like, for what? Like, what are you holding on to this thing for? I mean, and I, I wonder. Look, you, you know, our audience, I'm sure, will not be surprised to hear me say this because I always say this. You know, I, I'm I, I believe that this life is not it. I believe that you know, um, you know that that we have a, a, a an eternal destiny and. And we have a part to play in that and, and, and all that. But I mean, I, I wonder if you only think that this is it, right? The some 80 or some odd years that, that we're given, um, God willing, in the first world, you know, on this, on this planet. I mean, if you think this is it, maybe, maybe you do not want to ever give up. Uh, you you saying that makes me think of our old friend Dante. Right. Uh, right because, right. um, Right. You know, one of the things that really got to me when I first read The Divine Comedy was 
when in in the the drama of the the poem itself yeah. when the pilgrim dante and virgil get to a, a particular level of hell and he meets farinata farinata uh, Far, was a uh, from the generation ahead of dante he was a ghibelline warlord mm -hmm. uh, dante was on the other side politically and there he is in hell because yeah. he's condemned to hell because he believed that this life the earthly life was all that there is right. And uh, you see him there in, in hell when Dante encounters him. He rises up out of the fiery tomb and he starts going on and on and on act, uh, as if the world of Florence and, and, uh, and Tuscany that he was a part of, as if it still existed or mattered. Yeah. And it doesn't. Yeah. And, and this is one of the lessons there is that um, uh, in the poem is that all things pass. They do. And the glories of this world, nothing passes faster than that. And so Farinata got condemned to hell because he could only keep his mind on this world and its glories. And, um, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe we'll find Biden, Pelosi, Trump, and all the rest of them in the, this particular circle of hell. Uh, well, you know, right. I, I mean, obviously, even, even metaphorically, I think we, we understand, we, we can see that so clearly. You know, I mean, I, I can't get the image of, of, of Schumer and Colbert and some of these other guys, you know, dancing at the Napa Valley um, soiree they had this weekend, you know, while while Afghanistan is in the middle of blowing up and imploding and all these people are getting, you know, beaten and destroyed and killed and maimed in the streets. They're dancing there in this sort of beautiful scene in the in a vineyard in Napa Valley. And it's like, man, it's there's something really really gross about the whole thing playing playing a fiddle while something seriously burns. While, while while we burn you know and so you know we, we talk about the the the, the chernenko phase we seem to be living in you know um but in another one of your blog posts you know you you were talking about um you know this this sort of this this cultural sclerosis this sort of graveyard sensibility um, and, and some people seem to be really clued in on that, this sort of, uh, and are, and are kind of appropriately panicked and upset about it. And we still, and yet there are a bunch of people who seem to be dancing, you know, fiddling while, um, proverbial Rome burns. I mean, what, what do you uh, make it, of that? Well, you know, it's because people are scared, you know, people want to pretend like everything's always going to be this way. It's human nature. Yeah. I uh, spoke over the weekend to a friend of mine in New York City, Catholic, mm -hmm. who told me hadn't talked in a while. And yeah. he said that he and some of his Catholic friends and some sympathetic priests are already starting to lay the groundwork for an underground church if it comes to that. Uh, for keeping the work of the Catholic Church alive in the underground, inspired by the story of Father Tomislav mm. Kolakovic from, from my book. Yeah. And, um, but he told me that most people he knows, these are people who are good Catholics, who are just stumbling around in a fog because they can't accept what there's actually is right in front of them. And I, I got to be honest, you know, I can't sit in too much judgment because I remember on the morning of 9-11, after I saw the, the South Tower fall, I stumbled back to my, my apartment in Brooklyn in shock. And I, I, I mean, I say shock, I mean, really shocked. My wife yeah, said that's, shock. that's yeah. what it was because I, I remember stopping at a, a muffin shop in our neighborhood thinking, oh, my wife must have been watching the news all day. I bet she forgot to make breakfast. I'll bring her a muffin you know, with this apocalypse going on just across the river, but I, I couldn't accept what was happening. And yeah. Julie, my wife said that when she saw me, when I came in, you know, I had dust all over me. She said, you were kind of out of your head. Yeah. And I, I think that that, that was a, and my direct, a direct experience of how something so horrific can be happening and you just live in denial as a form of self-preservation. Now, I don't think people today are in shock in, in any kind of medical sense like that, but I think this is just part of it. I mean, we all know the stories of, of the Jews who stayed behind in Germany and Austria because they just didn't think it was going to get as bad as that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they were wrong. Now, I'm not saying that we're looking at the coming of Nazi Germany, not at all. I'm just saying that this is part of human psychology. And uh, but one of the things I want to say before we leave the the Chernyenko years yeah. of past is there was a there's a, a really interesting essayist. He's on the left in Sweden. A guy named Malcolm Kayuni. I guess that's how you say his name. It's an African name. The link is just below, guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he's on the left, but he also says a lot of things that resonate with the right. And one of the things he said in an essay that appeared uh, last week 
was that um, every elite, every ruling elite depends on legitimacy among the people who are ruled in order to maintain its power. Uh, as soon as the people stop regarding the elites as legitimate, it's over for them, whether it's the, the Bourbons in France or mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. czar in Russia and so forth. He said that, you know, we're living in a liberal, technocratic, managerial democracies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the elites that rule us depend for their legitimacy on being able to produce, to make things work. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, increasingly, they're not doing that. And so we are, we, enter, we are entering into a period of real peril because the entire legitimacy upon which their rule rests is their expertise. What happens if they get it wrong and they keep right. and, getting it wrong? Yeah, and, and expertise, um, you know, for our tastes, of course, it, 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 I think it means sort of basically, like, does it work? Yeah, yeah. You know, and we look around, um, you know, in, in, in many different respects, and, and we see things just simply not working, um, you know, uh, coordinated responses to uh, novel challenges seem to be deep shocks to the system that expose it as feckless yeah, and, yeah. and, and just it's not working. Um, man, well, I don't, me, go ahead. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a simple example that I may or may not have talked about before, but this is going to seem like a small anecdote, but it tells us something. It's something that I call a cultural broken window. Oh, okay. Uh, coming off of broken windows theory, which is this theory out of criminology that says that broken windows in a neighborhood are send a, a sign to others, wrongdoers, uh, criminals in the neighborhood that order does not matter here. And a broken window invites greater <clears throat> disorder. Well, this summer when I was in, uh, in Europe, um, I, I was in Slovenia on a uh, book tour and uh, I talked to a man, he's, he was my translator actually for a speech I gave there. Talk to this man who said his daughter was like 12 years old, Catholic man. And he said that she got online and got hooked up with some people in California or Oregon, kids a little bit older than her. And they were telling her, hey, you know, you've got to choose your gender identity before biology does it for you. And he said that his daughter is completely paralyzed now. He said she doesn't want to come out of her room. She doesn't want to go to school, doesn't want to eat because she has this insane idea in her head that she's got to choose her gender identity. Now, a lot of people look at this stuff, I and mean, I follow the libs of TikTok Twitter account. It's really funny. You I've really have to follow it, people. I mean, not just because it's funny, because it's, it's that thin line between being funny and being yeah. scary, scary, scary. Libs right. of TikTok, it's really libs worth your time. Yeah. But, but, but deep down, this is incredibly, incredibly damaging because yeah. here you have a little girl who at the, she's at an extremely vulnerable part, uh, point in her development. She just started puberty, uh, adolescence, hard period. The, she, the last thing she should be having to think about is which of 26, the right. guys said they gave her 26, are gender identities she has to choose from. Now, when you do this, when you put this crap into the minds of an entire generation and force them to think about these things and they get distracted, what are they not thinking about? It's going to make them just deeply, deeply damaged psychologically. It's going to retard their growth in some ways. It's just insane why you would do this. And yet our elites are pushing this in every platform they possibly can. Right. You know, and not just not, you know, they're the, they're the people who are actively participating and carting this out and, 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 and really in, sort of putting it out there and enforcing it on kids. Um, but you have a whole, you know, like, I don't think, for instance, that somebody like Nancy Pelosi sits around and, and sort of says, man, I can't wait to cart out the next sort yeah. of, you know, uh, gender bred elephant, you know, to, to sick on the kids, right? You know, right. or Schumer cares about this or any of these people who are in charge, but they, they seem to be all too willing to turn a blind eye to it and pretend that it's just it's not really that important, right? Right, right. Either, either it's not important or it's a great advance. They have to have it both ways. Right, you know? right, right, right. And, and so, you know, the, I could imagine they would hear people like you or me sitting here talking about how we're genuinely concerned for children who are having this stuff foisted upon them. Um, you know, the, 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 the Pelosi's in the world are probably laughing like, yeah, that's right, because you guys deserve <laughs> it. But then you have the real cult leadership 
Um, and it is a cult. I mean, I really think it's important that we recognize that this gender ideology um, uh, force is a cult. And um, if you, you know, spend 10, 20 minutes watching libs of TikTok and you'll, it's hard not to walk away thinking that this thing is, it, 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 it's, it's a cult. Um, but where are the adults in all this, Ralph? I mean, where, where are the people who are in charge? Normal people, right? I mean, not like me and you. I mean, people would expect people like me and you to be, quote unquote, against this sort of thing. But like, where are just like normal people who look at this and be like, well, that's crazy. A gender elephant? What the hell are you talking about? But yeah, I don't I, hear any of those voices. No, you know, I don't either. And I don't know whether they're not there or they're not magnified because our media don't want to hear from them. I am I, am I just but... missing it? Is it just not in my algorithm? So I'm just not hearing these voices? I really don't know. I mean, it just, yeah. if you had said 10 years ago, if you had just taken some of the, the headlines related to gender ideology and kids right. uh, and, and, and said, this is what it's going to be in 10 years, people would have freaked out. Right. And yet here we are. Is it because we're so demoralized? I mean, like, look, I wrote this week about how the Wiggles have famous, extremely famous and popular Australian kids series that my kids grew up on uh, yeah. in the in the early 2000s. Um, it's <clears throat> a, they now have a mostly a different cast because the cast has aged out. But sure, now sure. they've they've introduced a non binary um, figure, a non binary unicorn who uses they them pronouns. And it's like th that's a cultural broken window. You know, you, so who is the show for Rod? It's for preschool kids. Preschool, preschool kids. kids, yeah, and you know, and I can hear now liberals saying, "Oh God, I, I remember back when Jerry Falwell got upset because yeah. Tinky Winky, the Teletubby, right. was supposedly gay." Right. Well, that was nuts. Tink, yeah. Tinky Winky was, as far as I know, neither gay nor non-binary. But this is—I mean, that was just you know fundamentalist paranoia. Sure. This ain't that. They're openly right. saying that this this little character is non-binary. So why should preschool children have to deal with these crazy made up categories? But 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 you and I both know, Rod, you come on, you have to admit this. I mean, we're just going to get Falwelled in this in this story, right? We're, yep. You and I are going to be slimed as the sort of the the proto fundamentalists who, you know, get their knickers in a twist if you've got someone who's not, you know, wearing Talbots or Brooks Brothers. Yeah, and but the, and this is how this stuff keeps advancing through cultural shaming, especially among the middle class and the aspiring bourgeoisie. Um, you know, this summer when uh, we, we talked about this on the podcast, when the Hungarians passed this media law forbidding this kind of thing for their kids, you know, and ever, suddenly all the right thinking Europeans lost their mind about how there's bigotry and blah blah blah. Right. Um, I, I told you about how talking to some of these Hungarians about the actual things and showing them examples of what they banned, of how it's now uh, popular or, or widespread in the Anglosphere children's media, they couldn't believe it. I'm like, this is, I don't know whether you realize this was out there, but this is out there, people. And, and yet nobody says a thing here. It's weird. It's so weird. And I, again, I, I'm like you, Kel, I can't figure out whether just nobody cares or or whether people care, but they feel that they can't do anything about it. I had a pastor friend of mine write to me this morning. Uh, he's in another state, and yeah. he said he was invited to go give a talk at a big church, at a, a fundamentalist church. He's not a fundamentalist, but they're yeah. fundamentalists in his denomination. Yeah. And uh, he said they wanted him to come talk about um, gender ideology, and he's not sure what to say. <laughs> and, and I think he's not sure what to say simply because uh, he, and this is my, my guess, he figures that these folks just want to hear, just want to approach it from the position of this is disgusting, we're scared of it, how can we stop it? And their, their disgust is not wrong necessarily, but right. I told him, I said, you got to read Carl Truman's book about the, right. the sources of the self or whatever it's called. It's, that's not the title. I think that's a, um, a, a Charles Taylor title. But anyway, it's about the self um, because the that tells you. The modern self. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and the, the lake is below, guys. And by the way, let me tell you, uh, uh, Carl just told me that this mm. fall they're going to come out with a much shorter version, a condensed Good. version. That, that, that'll that be very get, helpful. That'll yeah, be very helpful. Yeah, want to get this book into the hands of pastors and teachers and, yeah. and parents who may not want to commit to reading a 400-page book. So they, they boiled it down. Anyway, I, I suggested to the pastor that you read this before you go talk to them because uh, uh, Carl Truman talks about how Gender ideology didn't just come from nowhere, that it is, 
it is in some sense a natural progression from this false idea, this false anthropology we have of what it means to be human. Right. Um, Rod, uh, I've been thinking a lot about this Wiggles business, not the Wiggles, but what, what you use as a sort of a flashpoint for this, this larger story. And uh, I think about all the, the, the context in which we're dealing with and how so much of this has sort of been rolled out, you know, vis-a-vis -vis social media platforms, you know, it used to be Tumblr. I think that the real story about Tumblr is yet to be fully written, but I think it was a hugely, hugely influential platform. Now you're looking at things like Instagram and, and, and TikTok seems to be the, the big thing right now. Um, how much of this social psychopathy has been um, accelerated or, or enhanced or, 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 or powered by the fact that so much of us have spent the greater part of a year and a half plus um, locked inside? I'm not sure how to answer that because I think it, it has to. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things my, my son, Matt, um, was grateful for mm -hmm. about me, we, we spent the summer together in Budapest, is yeah. that uh, I was offline. I was going yeah. outside, talking yeah. to people, getting into the real world and not being mm -hmm. stuck only in my my silo where I look at my Twitter feed and read the read news story. And I think that has to have a lot to do with it. I mean, this, this was there anyway, but I think yeah. the fact that we've had to be so uh, siloed and, and uh, alienated or, or atomized and, and not able to, to live a normal social life, well, I think that has to have accelerated some of it. Yeah, but you and I are grown men. You know, my identity, such as it is, um, you know, was formed prior to all of this, certainly in terms of COVID. But, you know, prior to the, you know, when they didn't have, I didn't have the internet growing up. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I lived the life uh, independent of all this sort of stuff. So questions of identity were different. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know. I mean, it's just, it, it, I remember I, I wrote about this on my Substack this week that when I was a kid, I was 15 years old or so, I guess must have been 90, uh, 82, 82. Yeah. I remember I was going through my teenage agnostic period, but for mm -hmm. me, um, I didn't know that God existed, but if he existed, of course, it was the Christian God. Sure. Um, sure. And uh, I didn't honestly didn't think beyond that because this was what was given to me. Yeah. Right. Well, now the 15 year old me sitting in my same hometown, which is just as small as it was back then. It's very, very hard for that kid to have the same uh, set of, uh, of choices in his head because yeah. we just know more now because of the Internet, because of pop culture and um I think that when you have a culture in, that has valorized choice uh, and made choosing the the greatest good, mm -hmm. then of course kids are going to be completely uh, d destroyed by anxiety over having to make all these choices. I, I remember talking a couple of years ago in my kitchen, I had a, a, a school teacher, high school teacher uh, over visiting, and she was saying that she remembers back when she first started teaching that she would get maybe one or two student meltdowns a semester. Yeah. She goes, now I get one or two a week in my yeah. class, in my office. And these, and things haven't changed that much in the lives and material lives of kids. The things that have changed is social media and the, the job it's done on kids' heads. I mean, you teach kids. What are you yeah. saying? Well, I, I think I think you're right. I think we know too much. And I think the implications of knowing too much. And let me be very clear here. In one sense, I don't think that you can quote unquote know too much. Like I'm a I'm a news hound, I'm an information hound, I like data, I like to know stuff. So I don't mean it that way, right? But but when you but when you have so when you have so much data, you know, there's a sort of a smog um, uh, uh, mm -hmm. effect that it, yeah. that it has upon you. So for instance, like think about, you know, I remember when I got my first like 64 pack of Crayola crayons, right? And so instead of blue, I had like six blues, right? And, and so you had periwinkle. Yeah, right, right. You know, and, <laughs> and, and so then, you know, you, but then you have to make that decision. Okay, well, um, what color blue is that shirt going to be? Is it light blue? Is it super light blue? Is it dark blue? Is it 
hat, you know, is it turquoise blue? You know, you, and, and now it's only 64 choices. So it's not like it's, it's completely overwhelming, but you reach that moment where you're like, wow, like I have to make a decision and is, I'm just coloring something on a page, but I have a decision to make. And now when I would use say it's blue, it meant one thing. Now it's blue can mean 20 things. Right. If you sort of expand it out in terms of, you know, so if you think about identity, like, I don't know, like I was a kid in Baton Rouge, like that, you know, like how, how, like you said, you know, if you would have gone on your vision quest, you know, uh, in 1982 versus going on your vision quest in 2022, my goodness, mm -hmm. you have a, you have a, a, an almost infinite palette with which to, to, to go at this. I, I don't know how that doesn't just melt you down. Well, you know, one of the cliches that you and I have heard all of our lives is information is power. Yeah, right, right. Well, what if information is powerlessness? Paralysis. Paral yes, paralysis. Because yeah. uh, and I think this could be part of the, the problem of our times. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting online a lot of the day, taking in information, more and yeah. more information. Yeah. But uh, I, it almost seems like in many cases, the more data I have, the less I know. Mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. we're we're compelled by the news cycle uh, to make snap judgments about things when in fact maybe we 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 just don't know enough to make a make a, a real judgment and i, I think that well how do you filter it out right i mean i think the question is we have all of this stuff that confronts us as phenomena in play or as options that are in play how do you filter out those things that are relevant and irrelevant, that are operable or inoperable, that are important and are not important. I mean, I think that's a real challenge, a real challenge. Yeah, you know, I, I this kind of go, takes us back in a surprising way to what we started out with, uh, talking about the St. Galgano and the mm -hmm. Andre Tarkovsky film, Nostalgia. Yeah. In that movie, the protagonist is a Russian writer who is in Italy to try to work on a book and he can't focus on the task in front of him because he's so distracted by thoughts, nostalgic thoughts of his right. wife and his kids back in Russia. Right. And, um, and it's, he is paralyzed by these thoughts, by all this data that's coming at him so that he can't focus on what's right in front of him. Right. And at the end of the movie, I mean, it's got a very strange ending, but he does this exercise. It's almost like it's a ritual and it's kind of like a religious ritual, but it's sure. not really religious, but that forces him to live in the moment. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I was thinking about that this week or last week, I read a book by this guy, Kyriakos Markides. Um, he's a sociologist of religion. who's written some books about Eastern Orthodoxy, but also in his early work, he did some work on this shaman, a modern day shaman in Cyprus with the yeah. Island of Cyprus, where he's born. And the shaman was talking about how if you're going to progress in the spiritual world, and again, he's kind of, it's kind of new agey stuff. You have to realize that the more fragmented your attention is, the weaker you are. If you want to really uh, gain power over yourself spiritually and use that power, you have to learn how to focus your attention. Now, this guy's talking about it from a new age perspective, sure. but this is exactly what the Benedictine monks say too. Right. that you have to have enough structure in your life to know when this is the time to stop taking in information. This is a time when you go work or you, right. you, or you go pray or you do something else. But if you, if you're constantly, if you're sitting in front of the computer all day, mm -hmm. taking in information as I do, then that does not lead to wisdom. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny. I think my, my instincts, you know, I, I as a, as a fellow um, information hound, um, you know, uh, when I'm when school's not in session, you know, I if I'm if I'm not careful, I could spend um, I, literally hours on Twitter if I'm not careful because I, I just I want to know what's going on. I mean, I, I care about ideas and you know all of that sort of stuff, right? And and fortunately, like in the school year, um, you know, my day is um, uh, inconveniently interrupted by you know classes, and mm -hmm. I have to prep classes and I have to. Have, conduct the classes and I have to grade quizzes and tests and essays and I have to, you know, and it keeps me sort of disengaged from the, the, the virtual spaces. And, you know, I, I you know, it, it's, a, it's a blessing, right? As much as I would like my undivided attention to do the deep work, et cetera. I mean, it's a blessing because it keeps me, it keeps me engaged in both the present, uh, uh, both in terms of time and in terms of space. Um, and, and when I 
when I virtual uh, um, wander off into virtual land in the social media landscape space, you know, it's it's very difficult to forget that I'm not living in reality. Yeah, but you know that on the other side, this is why I struggle with it so yeah. much because there's not a there's no set formula for dealing with this. Right. Um, most ordinary people, those who don't have the the uh, whose job is not to sift all this information, yeah. a lot of times they just don't see what's coming because yeah. it's not right in front of them. Right. You know, people right. like you and me, right. uh, journalists, analysts, things yeah. like that. Yeah. It's our job to take in information, see meaningful patterns, to be able to say what this means and what could be coming. Um, I've I, I've built my career totally uh, in, in the last. 10 years at least on this sort of thing. Yeah. And, um, and I think that being probably somewhat mildly on the autism spectrum helps me to see patterns that are not present to most ordinary people. This is certainly the case in that, that great Michael Lewis book, The Big Short, yeah. where there was a, a, a man, he was significantly on the spectrum and yeah. he failed out as a doctor, but he made a billion dollars because he could see deep patterns in the movements of the stock market that right. were invisible to others. And he knew the crash was coming. So uh, in, in his case, information was power, but he also had an extraordinary skill at being able to sift that information, discard what was useless and make sense of what was important to him. So what do you think has been your ability? Um, you know, you, you, you sort of are saying, and I, and, I, and I take you at your word, Rod, I think, you know, you, you're not using these phrases lightly, but sort of being mildly on the spectrum. Um, what think, what do you think um, has been your, uh, how have you been able to translate? I mean, you know, uh, people with sort of extreme autism would lack an ability to translate that pattern mm -hmm. seeing um, in any kind of intelligible or compelling way to the normies, right? What, what, what do you think has been, what do you think has given you the ability to make that kind of necessary translation? Maybe because I'm Does that make writer. sense? Does yeah, that make I, I, sense? I'm not sure, but I'm going to answer what I think you're asking. Is probably being um, not disabled by by the insight, um, and because it's so super mild. I mean, I remember my dad told me that um, he was my coach of our little league team. I was like nine to twelve years old. Yeah, and he said that I, I could see. He said, "Son, I could see you were tortured by playing because." I would look out there and see you on the field and knew that at every moment uh, before each pitch, you had in your mind where the play would be no matter where the ball was hit. Mm -hmm. And and you had it all clear in your mind, which was true, I did. Mm -hmm. He said, but you were also so anxious because none of the other kids were thinking like you. Yeah. And you're like, but you're going to mess up. You're going to mess up. And, and I had to laugh at my dad. He told me that many years later. And that's funny that he saw right. that, though. That, that's great that he saw that. That's interesting. Oh, he saw that and he was totally right. And that is, um, that is, you know, it, it's sort of a, a, a spin on the Cassandra thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I know. You know, I, I, I and maybe that's, maybe that's, you know, people, you know, I, and I would put myself in that category, you know, sort of watchers and seers and observers of the scene. You know, it's like I, I find myself going in and out of, uh, of, of, of being in the present versus being away and like, you know, taking yeah. the, 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 you know, nothing would make me more deeply introspective than, th you know, throwing me in, into a dance club. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I like having a good time. I even like dancing and I, and I like to do those sorts of things. But man, every now, you know, every second, third time out, I would be immediately sent into this sort of deep, dark removed place where I'm sort of taking it all in and it was really tough for me to sort that that out I didn't know why that happened because it didn't seem to be happening to my friends they seemed to be perfectly fine uh, sure, uh, living sure. and dancing and breathing and and mugging in the mm -hmm. moment and I'm like you know feeling like Plato over here you yeah know, well uh, uh, that's what my dad was saying he's like these other little kids they were just little boys having a great time you know but yeah. I was deeply overthinking everything, but mm -hmm. the thing is, I couldn't turn it off. Yeah. I, it's so hard to turn it off, and I, mm -hmm. I think that you know, if I, um, if my my physical constitution were somewhat different, I'd probably drink heavily just to yeah. turn it off. Yeah, you know, but I, I don't don't worry, listeners. I don't. <laughs> I, I'm not a. I'm not much of a drinker, but I. There are times when I just want it to go away. Yeah, and. Um, but I just think that's, look, that's how we're made, you know, yeah. and uh, my wife has, uh, 
come up to me before because she can tell I'm in kind of a fugue state when I'm lost yeah. in thought. Yeah. And she's like, I've been talking to you for the last yeah, last yeah. minute. And um, it's just, that's just how I am. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I could, and I think, and I think for, 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 for me, at least the phenomena is I'm, I'm looking at all this sort of stuff unfold um, culturally. I'm looking at this stuff unfold in the church. I'm looking at this stuff unfold at, at the political level, both locally and nationally. I look at the way that this is unfolding in, um, in the multinational scene and in, 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 in the government and in, in the, in the, in the armed forces. And it's, it's really difficult because I, I, I want to yell, I want to scream, I want to, guys, look at what is going on here. Can't you see this? And and I don't know, I, I can't shut that off. I mean, I think no. that's what I've been struggling with. And you with shouldn't, lately. you shouldn't shut it off. I think that the thing that people like you and, you and uh, me would think we have to deal with is not being dealing with anger. Like uh, when I, this mm -hmm. is something I'm really struggling with, like, especially when I find something so grotesquely uh, illustrative of my live not by lies thesis. Yeah. I'm like, come on, man, can't yeah. you see what they're doing? Yeah. Um, uh, Apple, for example, recently saying that it's going to go to people's <sighs> iPhones looking for child pornography. I know. I'd I love know. it if they would get rid of child pornography, yeah. but there's no way for them to do that without, you know, really crossing some huge lines. Well, and look, and I feel the same way about, I don't know if you saw that story about OnlyFans. You know the site that you know you uh, it's basically yeah. been a uh, uh, well it's been a bunch of things but it's primarily like most like most of the internet you know it's it's turned into a sort of a private pornography yeah. um, site right so that it, it it but it's run by you know mostly by by the the woman who is you know whatever stripping or whatnot you know for her for her fans and they just came out and I believe they said they were pulling. Um, uh, explicit pornography off of the site and so like on the one hand I'm like well good like I'm I'm always a fan for making less pornography available I guess you know on, on the scene I certainly don't want that for for children and certainly don't want that for men and women who struggle with this at a, at a very addictive level um, that, that it ruins their lives but then on the other side like do I really want you know more corporate sort of oversight and I, I'm, I'm really conflicted about these things I don't Really know what what to yeah. think about this rod oh here's a here's a uh, some news for you i hadn't told you this but mm -hmm. uh this sunday is coming sunday i will be in a private audience with pope francis you're here uh no pope. you're not wow yeah as part of this conference i'm going to in, in rome it's a small a relatively small group i think probably about 100 people are going into the vatican for a private audience with the pope and um I'm so tempted to uh, bring a copy, a Spanish language copy of the Benedict Option. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I probably will find it. I think I have a Spanish copy somewhere here of Live Not By Lies. I might yeah. bring that to him. And yeah. not, not that he has time to read it, but, um, you know, I mean, I, you know, and our regular listeners and readers of my blog know that Pope Francis is not my favorite Pope. No, but, no. But he's the Pope, and I've never yeah. had a chance to meet a Pope. So, yeah. um, I'm gonna, no, I'm no, go. that's that, that 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 would be great. I mean, you know, and um, uh, that's interesting though, though, uh, and maybe this is the last thing that we'll talk about. That 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 uh, these two books that you've written in the last what five years, right? Yeah. The Benedict Option came out when uh, published in spring of 2017, and uh, Living Up by Lies fall of 2020. All right, so yeah, so basically in the last three and a half years, you you've come out with these two books, and. Um, I, you know, in, in certain respects, I, I cannot tell you how many times I come across folks online talking about the Benedict option recently, I would say in the last couple of months, and, and how many people have basically said, yeah, like this thing came out, whatever, you know, three and a half years ago, four years ago, and I was like, wah, 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 whatever, Rod, you're a crazy person. And now I think Rod's kind of right. You know, and it's, it, it, no, it's true. No, it's, it's true. true. No, I hear it too. I get yeah. it all. I got this letter I put on my blog. Somebody said this came out, you know, when I was in high school and Benedict Option came out, I thought it was crazy. And now I see you're absolutely right. I get this all the time. Yeah. You know, and, and it's, it's one of those, you know, and then this must be a strange thing that does in fact happen in the publishing world that a book kind of comes out too early, you know, and, and I wonder, I wonder, you know, <laughs> The Benedict Option Part Two. You know, you should sort of come out with one. Um, you know, now because I, I I do think that there are more people that are that that have now have ears to hear what you're trying to say. Now, fortunately, it's a book, so you can pick it up, and so 
folks, I encourage you to pick up uh, the Benedict Option as well as Live Not By Lies because I do think that they kind of function together. I think they're they interesting. They um, yeah. And in certain respects, Live Not By Lies is sort of part one to Benedict Option being kind of a part two in a, in a sort of conceit uh, in, 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 a, in a way there. But yeah. it's, um, it's, um, it's time. I mean, this is the time. And I think people need to, um, you know, listen. Pay well, I appreciate maybe, yeah. may, maybe Pope Francis will... Well, we'll give it a read. That'd be fantastic. Well, thanks. Thanks for saying that. But, you know, I remember having dinner once with Patrick Deneen at Notre Dame and, mm -hmm. you know, and he said that uh, this was, I don't know, three years ago. And, he, and I was saying that, yeah, Benedict Option, it sold well, but I kind of hoped that it would have done more. Mm -hmm. He said, look, relax. It's going to take people a few years to understand it. But once we get uh, past Trump and uh, and mm -hmm. the Democrats come back to power and that things are going to accelerate and Christians will, the conservative Christians will understand, will be more amenable to your, to your argument. And I, I think that when you have somebody like Joe Biden during the campaign, he put a tweet out, his campaign put a tweet out in his name, yeah. say that transgender issues are the civil rights issues civil of our time. Issue of our time. Right. And so, but th this goes back to what you were talking about earlier, Cale, yeah. about how we know that Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi and aren't sitting around thinking about gender ideology necessarily, but mm -hmm. when they give their imprimatur to this sort of thing and get behind the Equality Act, you know, they do own it at a certain yeah. level. When it goes past the, uh, I mean, gosh, what, 10, 15 years ago, it was just in gender studies programs at colleges. Yeah. And now yeah. it's, you have the, the man who is now the president of the United States talking about transgender rights or the, I mean, it's it's big and people like you and me saw this coming a long time ago and I, i'm not saying that and like pat to pat ourselves on the yeah, back but just yeah. to say folks it's not going to get any better anytime soon well well as, as one of your 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 updates uh, on, on on your post this week said you know to you look people i i i i i'm in graduate school i i i live with these people i study with these people and make no mistake about it they want your children <laughs> and i think that that is so true they want your children their goal is to make everything queer and i don't mean that i mean like i mean that in a very sort of gender studies kind uh -huh, of uh -huh. way yeah. you know they want to destroy all categories um uh -huh. uh, i don't know why uh, that that's what they would want to do. But I think we have to take them very seriously um, at their word. I mean, they mean yeah, it when they talk about dismantling and disrupting, they actually mean it. Yeah, yeah. And, and she, this, the author of that, she wouldn't let me use uh, her name or her right. school, but she goes to an elite college and she emphasized that the graduates of my college, they go into uh, positions of power in oh. government and industry and things like in institutions. And they are the ones that set the rules. They're the ones that set the tone. This is what uh, James Davison Hunter, the U University of Virginia sociologist said that uh, people who think that cultural revolutions happen from the bottom up really don't understand how yeah. it works. It's all, it always comes with the elites and elite networks becoming convinced of a certain idea and implementing it. And so this is why you have to pay attention. This is why it matters when you have people, and this has been well documented in the, right. in the press because the press thinks it's a great idea. You've had these people out in Hollywood who are talk about how they want to queer um, children's programming, queer comic books and things like that. They really do believe this stuff. And, um, and they depend on, uh, on normies just saying, oh, it's, this is a passing fad or this, or it's, it's funny, or it's, it's funny, you know, it's, or it's it's, it's 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 transgressive. So isn't that cool? My kid can be sort of hip, and it's like no, you guys just don't get it. You know, you don't get it, and it's uh, it's it's frustrating. That's it's so really then, frustrating. and then you wake up and your kid is making a TikTok video yeah. like that shows up on lives with TikTok, or your kid is like that poor tormented Slovenian right. child right. who can't get out of bed because she's just again, tormented by thoughts of what is my real gender. Yeah, paralyzed by 26 different options or, yeah. or 260 options. I mean, what's the bloody difference? It's so, it's so um, demonic, you know, and, and, and that way of sort of that ripping apart, demonic. Ripping apart, kind of ripping diabol apart. And, and of yeah. confusion, which is right. always a sign. That's right. So, um, but uh, anyway, I, I am uh, happy to tell you, my friend, that I will be on that plane to Rome wearing my, my N95 mask. Hey, you know, this is, I don't know if wait, you've wait, been in. But I thought, I thought the, I thought you're vaccinated. Don't the vaccines work? 
Yeah, you got to wear the mask. You got to wear the mask. But but I flew in February of last year, and there was no such thing as a a vaccine even at that point. And I sat there with my little. Uh, I didn't even have an N95. I think it was just one of those little surgical masks. And I sat, I sat, you know, shoulder to shoulder and we sat on that tarmac for an hour and a half. So huh. um, I don't know how I didn't well, get the COVID then. So. Well, you gotta, you gotta wear an N95, at least to travel internationally. And I, it's difficult. You have yes. to wear that thing the whole time. I remember when I flew over before, when I wanted to sleep, I just put a, the the blanket over my head and took the yeah. thing off and fell asleep. But yeah. uh it is, it is tough. I mean, air travel is never any fun, uh, no. but it's really uh, onerous this time. But who can complain? Because I'll be in oh, Italy. I'm so jealous. I, I, I was originally going to be there in Italy with you this uh, th- th- this late summer, but uh, we couldn't get the, the trip off the ground because of... Uh, actually, I couldn't get my passport renewed. I realized that a couple of years ago, I let my passport... Um, uh, lapse. And so in order for me to get my passport renewed, it's going to be 12 weeks. Before. Oh, yeah. And it it took me, I had to get mine renewed. I, I could see it was coming up. It was going to expire this September. Yeah. It took me, gosh, four months. Yeah, 12 weeks. Yeah, there I mean, it's, it's crazy. So if anybody thinking I'm just picking up and jetting off overseas somewhere, it ain't going to happen no, <laughs> if you don't no, your passports. Not. But now's a good time to get your passport renewed. If it's going to expire any time in the next year, go ahead and get it done. Yeah, for sure. Look, uh, uh, audience, friends, uh, hate watchers, if you could do me and Ron a favor by liking and subscribing and hitting the little alert bell for this podcast, that would be most appreciated by us. Um, also, if you want to put in the in the comments here below um, some topics that you'd like for me and Rod to chew on, I'd, I'd be happy to hear your feedback. We also have an email address, the general eclectic podcast at gmail.com. I promise to check uh, the email uh, and see if there's anything y'all want to talk about or some feedback or hate mail you want to spew at me or Rod. You know, you go ahead. I can always hit the delete button if it's really nasty. But uh, until then, Rod, I want you to enjoy Rome, uh, enjoy Italy. Um, please drink and eat for me while you're there. Pray uh, for me and for our audience at uh, San Galgano. And until then, why don't you send us off? Don't get nothing on you. Take care, man.